Hi, this is Conrad Zimmerman with Fish Shark Marketing. If you're into our show, we hope you'll consider supporting us with a small monthly contribution through Patreon. For less than the price of admission to a donkey show, you can help us conceive acts of equally senseless depravity. Just visit patreon.com slash fishshark or click the big Patreon button at fishshark.com for more information. And thanks for listening. You know viruses that turn people into zombies and how they're not real? Sure, yeah. I mean, despite our best efforts. Yeah, well, they are now. Because we made them. What? We've done it? Yeah, it's no big deal. Fish Shark Labs came back to me this morning, said they finally cracked it. They ran a test case. Upon contact with the virus, any human being exposed within seconds turns into a ravening, flesh-eating, undead monster. It's brilliant. A little bit funny as well. This is huge. It's, this is like uh, one of the tent poles of the business. We've been working towards this forever. And, and now, I mean, gosh, we, could, we can finally sell this. After a few preliminary arrangements have been made. We can't just say to the world, hey, we've got a zombie virus. It's open to all bidders. Not initially, anyway. We've got to build the simulator first. So there's still testing to be done. Oh, no, no, no. The virus itself is perfect. That's taken years of intricate planning, of experimentation, practical and theoretical testing. I mean, it's, it's beautiful in its perfection. But before we can sell this to anybody, we need to prove it works. And we do that, first of all, by reappropriating an old Russian underground base that I've bought recently with company funds. Okay, so you, you, you've purchased a submarine installation from the former Soviet Union. Yes. I mean, if it's any consolation, we have painted over all of the logos with fish shark logos. There are fish shark logos everywhere. That's priority one. Mm -hmm. I mean, God forbid one of the senior partners make their way through for an inspection of a facility and find something not appropriately labeled with a fish shark insignia. Exactly. It cost us several million in blue and white paint to get the, uh, the logos done. But that's done. That's an expense that we can write off because it's finished. That's how writing off expenses work. Same goes for the, the whole sub base and everything. And the... The weather control panels, of course. I'm sorry, w weather control panels? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. What we've done is we've taken the huge spaces inside this sub base. You won't believe how big this space is, by the way. It's the size of several cities and then some, which is good because we've built several cities and then some underground in Russia. Cities? Plural? You've built multiple cities? Yeah, I mean, well, you know, we're, we're not being extravagant here they're only several blocks wide but we've got a recreation of moscow we've got a recreation of new york tokyo london paris some random american suburbs for no reason and we've just got all that collected in there connected with corridors that have lasers in them that cook people i don't want to say that this sounds uh extravagant uh because i'm sure there's a very very good reason why you would need this many of these sort of large spaces. Couldn't, couldn't you just have one? No, no, no. That's, that's the beauty of the situation. You see, in order to sell this drug to the Russians, we simulate what zombies look like in America. And then to sell the drug to the Americans, we show them what zombies look like in Russia. That's why we have so many clones. Wait, wait, we have uh, back, back, back up, back up, back up, back up, back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What you struggling with? Uh, we have clones. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We perfected the art of cloning uh, shortly after the zombie virus because we realised we needed people to test it on. So we invented cloning, and uh, yeah, just filled our underground sub base in Russia full of clones. We had okay. We 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 invented cloning. Yeah, we invented cloning. 
we, we, we worked out all of the kinks. We now produce perfect clones. Hey, look, we're fish shark marketing. No expense spared when it comes to advertising, right? Right. No, no, I, I understand that. I understand that. Are, are we using the clones for anything else? What? Well, I mean, it's just, it's, it seems to me that, that here we have what is really just a game-changing technological advance in the form of, of, of human cloning. Right. And we're not selling that? I mean, it's a game-changer insofar as we were really struggling to work out how to sell our zombie virus, and then we invented cloning and realized, hey, cool, we can sell our zombie virus to people now. So in that regard, I guess you're correct, but... This really is all about the zombie virus. I don't know if you, I don't know if you quite understood the gravity of this. Um, all it takes is a bite. Oh, zombie bite you. You turn into zombie. Wipe out a whole city. And that's how you win wars. And that's why people will pay lots and lots of money to have this wonder drug. So here's the thing I don't understand about this. Like under a traditional kind of Cold War mentality, right? You each have these world-ending weapons, and you won't use them because you know that the other person has similar world-ending weapons, right? Yeah. And so you just don't deploy it. It's just the threat that they could be deployed keeps everybody behaving. Sure, sure. But if we're just secretly dealing with every country on Earth selling them this, Mm -hmm. how are they going to know that their enemy has it? They won't. I mean, they wouldn't buy it otherwise. Like, if we were if we were showing the Kremlin what a zombie attack looks like in America by sacrificing thousands of clones to show them this zombie drug that we've made, then they're going to be far less interested if they find out that we've got the president on the line having a look at what's going down in our pretend Moscow that we built for a long time with lots of money. It's part of the strategy, then. If everybody's got something, then nobody's going to want it. So we keep it all secret. We keep a little biological arms race going. I don't know quite how arms races work, but I'm pretty sure that's how it works, is you deal with everybody in secret, and then everybody buys it. That sounds right. It's, you know, I mean, I, I would think that you would say, hey, you know, this guy already has this, so you should probably buy from me. But, uh, but you know... I mean, I'm no expert. I mean, we could do that too. I mean, to be honest, I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing with any of this. So, I mean, I'll take feedback unless it's unless it's about, you know, doing anything else with the clones or the expense of rebuilding cities to show people. You know, spending $50 billion on a subterranean commercial seen only by world leaders and some terrorists... It has been criticised by some of my peers in this company as an excessive waste of money, and I won't hear it, because you've got to spend money to make money. That's that's exactly what I was thinking. Like, no, I you'll never hear me dispute the amount of money. I just, I'm wondering if we're missing some opportunities along the way. We could be using those clones as, as, well, employees. Why does everybody keep focusing on the clones? Every time I, I talk to people about this, they keep mentioning the clones as if as if that's the, the star power here. The clones were made to sell the virus. That's their job. And they're not doing a very good job of it at the moment because everybody keeps looking at the clones. Okay, well, then, then we, we just need to demonstrate the effectiveness of the virus it, it is really what it comes down to in a, in a very clear and direct manner. And I can't be any more clear and direct than building underground cities, filling them with clones, and then killing those clones. Um, I mean, if anyone has a better way, if anyone in this office has a better way of doing this, I'm all ears. Shut up, Doris, you don't know what you're talking about. Just inject one person and show them the effects. Idiot! What would I do with the underground base? She doesn't think these things through. You don't think these things through. It's, oh, so simple when you're standing on the outside. I understand. Yeah, it's really easy to criticize. and, and don't really understand the pressure that I'm under. I'm impressed. I, I have to say I'm impressed with the, with the result. The zombie virus is, like I said, that's something we've, we've all dreamed about. And, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to the day when, uh, when we'll be able to sell the antidote, too. The what?
I think it's time to reopen the cold case. I, I just can't let this go. I realise that I've been told to move on, but I think I can tell you in confidence that it haunts me. I can understand why. It, it is certainly one of the great mysteries of our time. In, in the entertainment world. Certainly. It is akin to the Black Dahlia mystery. Oh, definitely. I mean, in terms of what has happened in the entertainment world, I don't think you you find a a greater unknown. I mean, it's either that or who Carly Simon was singing to. And and we've solved that mystery. That's that's the great mystery of this whole thing is, is we know the players. We know who's involved. We know the Beach Boys were there. We know the name of the perp. The mystery is we don't know what Barbaran did. Well, I, I think that they perpetrated a cover-up, the Beach Boys did. Like, I think there was just so much shame. Right. Yeah, they, they needed to call out their uh, attacker, but were unwilling to go with specificity into the details yeah. of what transpired. And, I mean, I can only imagine how horrific it must have been. Yeah, well, I mean, like like a lot of documentation from that time, it's very vaguely written and has a lot of O's in it. The, the record has a lot of repetition. To some extent, you could think, oh, well, they're just repeating that same story, that same line, that same bit of information over and over again to get their story straight. But I genuinely think it, it's a matter of consistency. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. They are so definite in what happened, but unwilling to speak it. Well, this seems to be a running thing with the Beach Boys. I went through all of their documentation to see if throughout their other notes there's any other reference to this Barbara Ann. And apparently... For for people who were prolific writers for their day, their their narratives are just not well written. Mm-hmm. Very threadbare. Very threadbare. Skeletal. Very simplistic. But the one thing that's clear is that whatever Barbara Ann did, she left those boys of the beach rocking and a rolling and rocking and a reeling. And when things rock and reel me, they're pretty damn horrific. I mean, by now they'd have to be horrific. I've been to Dean Kane's house slash urinal. That seems like a response to stimulus that you know you're you're trying to avert or more hurt. You know. Well, with some of this stuff, we're looking at a complete psychological breakdown. I mean, who writes Barbara Ann? Bar 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 Barbara Ann. She's done something to fuck these boys at the beach right up. Clearly, they've given him a stammer. He can't even say their name without choking. In text! Imagine how shaky the quill was when he put this on the parchment. They're just stuttering their way. b b b b barbar ann b b b b And I feel for them, because that, that kind of reaction that only comes when you had a, a, like a, a serious psychological break mm-hmm. somewhere along the line. Mm-hmm. Like, Brian Wilson totally had his shit together up till this point. I think that this is the moment where Brian starts to spiral into his depression. I think it all goes back to Barbara Ann. Now, now maybe I'm just being a literalist, but do you think that the, the incoherent nature of some of the text could be because he was writing one-handed? Because as he references multiple times in the song, she's taken one of them. Oh... I don't know if, if she was planning to pull him apart piecemeal. I mean, he does say she's always scratching it. So I'm assuming that once she removed the hand, uh, she she was just picking at the, you know, at the wrist. Well, I, I, think, I think the idea was that Brian offered the hand as sort of a, a, a compromise. I think I think she, I think Barbara Ann wanted the head. Right. And and Brian Wilson said, "Well, no, hold on. Hold on." Yeah, well, Brian Wilson famously can't live without a head. No, exactly. So he said, "Well, we'll just settle for a hand." Yeah, if I were Brian Wilson, I'd give up a hand cuz cuz they can grow back. And a cunning choice of hand, too, because you know, clearly it wasn't his writing hand. If you ask me, I think he should have stuck with Peggy Sue. But he tried that. Clearly, he said he tried Peggy Sue. Um, now, I don't know if he tried Peggy Sue before 
or after Buddy Holly was there. Like, I'm not sure if Brian Wilson was, like, you know, getting some sloppy seconds from Buddy Holly there. But, I mean, Barbara Ann is the one that made him rock and reel, not Peggy Sue. You know, she was just pretty. Pretty, pretty, pretty. I always liked Peggy Sue, if, if I'm being perfectly honest. She never took anybody's hands. That, that's the one thing you can say about Peggy Sue. If, you know, she drowned that cat that time, but she never took anybody's hands. She took the cat's paws, but paws technically aren't hands, and she needed a trophy. It, it seems to me like a classic example of not knowing what you've got mm-hmm. in regards to Peggy Sue. Yep. He didn't know that he had his hands. You know, he had both of them, and he didn't realize how good he had it until he left Peggy Sue and went to the dance and met Barbara Ann. Now, the thing I'm kind of wondering about is the timeline of all of this. Did she take the hand at the dance? And and if that's the case, why are there not more eyewitness accounts of this? So far, the the only people we could draw on for for first-hand accounting of what happened is Carl, and he's got nothing to say for himself. He's too busy scratching babies. And Hal, who is preoccupied with his famous ashtray, which I'm very pleased to say we represent. It must not. Have, it was either not a big dance, or there's a lot of people that know shit that aren't talking. In addition to these two, and mm-hmm. I don't. I don't want to cause problems for our clients. I'm not talking about bringing up people we represent under a grand jury or anything. But there's got to be some people out there who have some idea what happened here. It wasn't that long ago, like fifty, sixty years. I, I think the time has come for the truth to come to bear. We reopen the investigation. And then I'll find out what the fuck smell like Rocky means. Oh, shit. What is it? Uh, so I, I put my hand in my pocket. Yeah. You know, just to, just to play with my testicles, as, as is my want. And, and my right. Let's, let's be perfectly honest. I'm not on trial here. I just wanted to play with my testicles. You're just simply exercising your First Amendment right to scratch. Exactly. Unfortunately, when I put my hand in my pocket, I got something I wasn't expecting. It wasn't a lump, was it? No, it was pocket change. Oh, no. No. No, Jim. Couple quarters. No, don't, don't say it, Jim. A nickel. Oh, God. And a dime. Oh, fuck! I had a dime in my pocket and brought it into the building. You gotta tell the people, when you're buying your condoms, no dimes. No dimes. You know what's gonna happen, Jim. I did the no dime mime. No one gets the no dime mime. Do you think we should actually tell businesses what it is, so that when we're there making big circular motions and shaking our heads in the middle of the Walgreens, that they'll actually know what we're talking about? Because I was doing that, and I got a dime. That's not universal? I thought that was universally known. The the universal signal for no dimes, please. Two hands, flat forward in front of you, waved in circles. Yep, shaking your head so they know no. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm fairly certain I wasn't nodding my head, which is, of course, the yes dime mime. I just don't understand what they're teaching kids in these schools. Certainly nothing about finances. Well, I mean, it's in the building now. You know the rules. Yeah, I know the rules, but... Why does... Why does this dime have to be taken to the building across the street and put in the vault? I, I thought I thought you knew this. The, the, the senior partners, they're big fans of DuckTales. They are convinced that Scrooge's lucky dime is a real thing. But but there's no way for them to know which dime it is. So they're just having us collect all of the dimes. This is the problem with the senior partners. Not that there's a problem with the senior partners. There are no problems with the senior partners. No, no. This is a problem with DuckTales. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It, has, has the doll's eyes stopped glowing? Uh, yeah, okay, this is the problem with DuckTales. Is that the senior partners don't understand it or most cartoons. In fact, they're largely terrified by animation. Clearly, the the problem with DuckTales is that it is spreading these sort of dangerous myths throughout our society. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which the senior partners then take A, very literally, and B, get wrong through no fault of their own. Uh, For them to assume all dimes are lucky, or that there is a real lucky dime and it's a process of elimination. I mean, it's not quite what DuckTales was about, but we do have a sort of money bin now. A bit like DuckTales, except it's full of dimes. Exclusively dimes. Correct. It is full of dimes, and, if I may make so bold, I'd say it's too many dimes. You think so? Well, the building makes noises when you walk past it now. Uh, Yeah, that doesn't sound good. Bear in mind, they've been collecting dimes since before even we worked here. Oh yeah, no, this has been going on for decades. I have no idea what fucker introduced the senior partners to DuckTales. Whoever it is, I hope they're dead. Uh, Given this company's turnover, it's a very good chance they're dead. Statistically likely, yeah. Yes. But why we should have to live and, and, and pay for their sins, I do not know. And that's multiple forms of the word pay at play there, because that's how clever I am. But we're at this point now where I think anybody knows that one of these dimes could be the last dime they ever deposit. We're at the point where the structural integrity of that cracking, creaking building is at, it's at breaking point. I'm worried I'm going to go in there, climb the ladder, drop this one dime in, and that's the last thing I'll ever see before I get a face full of metal. I think you're probably right. I mean, we've been start. I-, I don't know about you, but I've started to observe some cracking in you know the edges of the building itself. Mm-hmm. The building itself is is crumbling under the strain of decades of dimes. The dimes keep expanding. But the building doesn't grow with it, which is inconsiderate of concrete to begin with. Mm-hmm. You know, not to question the wisdom of the senior partners, because as we all know, they they know what's best. They are wiser than the wisest wise man. But I do think that maybe we didn't anticipate some of the challenges inherent to building a very, very large, thick concrete vault eight floors up in that building unyieldingly concrete unyieldingly thick with a very specific amount of space that the dimes are now encroaching upon because if it's not if it's not the pressure that gets us it's going to be the weight oh absolutely something's going to happen we're we're looking at two situations here either i pop this dime in and i'm convinced it's going to be me now i drop this dime in the building explodes the cracks pull apart the foundation collapses in on itself and it goes off sending coins and bricks all across boston the other situation is i drop that dime in The underside of the building gives way, and we are drowning in a tidal wave of dimes. Either way, this is a ticking dime bomb. No, you're you're 100% correct. I and I, I'm not sure how we dissuade them from continuing to collect dimes in this way. I mean, really, what we need to do probably is just set up a perimeter around the fish shark building. We should protect ourselves. Yeah, I mean, maybe we could change the metal detectors downstairs to specifically detect dimes. Mm -hmm. And we can, you know, turn people away at the door before they come in. Because, I, you know, we're stuck between uh, a dime and a hard place here in a lot of ways. The dimes come in, we have to put them in the vault. Uh, There's no defying the senior partners. They get very, very angry. They knew I had the dime in my pocket before I did. There's no no doubt about that. No, I'm sure of it. And so you can't hide the fact that you've brought it in. They'll punish you. You can't not put it in or they'll punish you. You can't even take the springboard out of the vault without punishment. No. Even after those kids broke their necks. And now, now we're dealing with a situation where it takes one child to try to jump in that dime pole and inevitably breaking their neck. But more importantly... For them to destroy the building. Oh, yeah. Just the added pressure of another child could be enough. And it's, it, 
it's reaching a point where it's so full that it's difficult to imagine even trying to dive into it. I don't know if you could injure yourself any longer on the amount of dimes that are in there, just because the distance from the board, it's like four feet. I don't think we have to worry necessarily about like broken limbs and spines as much now as we did, say, ten years ago. Not that we worried too much about them then. Well, no. And that might be part of the problem. We'd, we'd possibly have room for more dimes if we'd have ever cleared some of the carcasses out of there. Well, that's Yeah, that, that takes up a lot of space. You, you got a good point. When you get ten years deep into that dime pile, I dread to think what's down there now. Fist Shark Marketing is Jim Sterling and Conrad Zimmerman. Theme music by Ben Rama. Additional music by Alizar Chand. Our editor is Austin Yorski. Get more episodes and learn how to support the show at FistShark.com. Follow us on Twitter at FistShark for more of our exploits. Complaints can be forwarded via email to fistsharkmarketing at aol.com. And remember, things are rarely as bleak as they appear. They're usually worse. Goodbye.